Hello, you're watching Talking Europe. I'm Catherine Nicholson at the European Parliament in Brussels. Today, we're looking outside of the European Union to a region that's experienced war, major political upheaval and economic change in the last 30 years. I'm talking about the Western Balkans, namely Albania, Bosnia and Herzegovina, Croatia, Montenegro, North Macedonia and Serbia. Now, one of those countries is already a European Union member, Croatia. The others are all at various stages of attempting to join. There has been a knockback, however. Albania and North Macedonia had been expecting to get the green light for the formal accession process to begin in 2019. But in October, they were told by European leaders that they will have to wait. Well, we're asking today, how ready are these countries and how ready is the EU to start the process? What if the EU drags its heels for too long? And we might even get time for a mention of other would-be members of the EU, like Ukraine and Georgia, perhaps. Our guests today are Andreas Schieder, Austrian MEP from the Socialists and Democrats group. Hello there. Hello. And it says, well, you're also chair of the EU Northern North Macedonia Joint Parliamentary Committee. Exactly. An expert in this area. Tineke Strik, Dutch MEP from the Greens Group, a, a member of the same committee. Hello yes, there. Yes, hello. Thanks for joining us. And Bernard Guetta, French MEP from the Renew Europe Group. That's Emmanuel Macron's group here at the European Parliament. Uh, you're a member of the Foreign Affairs Committee. Absolutely. As are our other two like guests, I ought to say. Like yes. <laughs> so uh, we'll get started. Uh, it was France, the Netherlands, and Denmark, who all rejected Albania joining, uh, starting the accession process. France also rejected North Macedonia. Uh, so I'm interested in your position, everybody. Uh, should these countries now, with a couple of months further on, be allowed to start formal accession? Bernard Guetta, I'll come to you because France, a double no. Mm -hmm. It wasn't a no. It wasn't a veto, not at all. Uh, it was, on my eyes, a rather wise decision for uh, two reasons. First, uh, Macron said, let's change, let's reform the accession process before opening again the doors of the European Union to new countries. I think it was wise because uh, let's remember uh, um, in France and in Netherlands, the two no to the uh, European Constitution uh, 10 or mm -hmm. 12 years ago. Why those two no at that time? Mainly, I would say, mainly because the people didn't understand the enlargement to countries they didn't know. But in they this case, know. France was relatively isolated. It had support no, no, on no, Albania, no. but on North Macedonia, it was all ah, alone. OK. Alors, let's think about a situation with yes to Macedonia and no to Albania. It would have been quite a crisis in this area, quite insulting for Albania, very touchy, very, very touchy. And by the way, now, just two sentences. Uh, France uh, put on the table new proposals for the accession process. Mm -hmm. And generally, generally, direct, the direction, including in Macedonia and Albania, are very positive to this proposal. Well, I think that's disputable. We'll ask our other yes. guests about the reaction. <laughs> yeah, well, I think my party did not agree with the decision of the Netherlands to block the uh, Albania. We think it, it has been a major blow in the region, especially, of course, in the specific countries, because there were high expectations. This is a process not that has started now, but it had started uh, more than 15 years ago with uh, uh, promises that if they would take take certain measures that at a certain moment and if they would meet that criteria that the negotiation mm. process would start. So we don't talk about accessing the EU but starting the negotiation process. Now both of the countries have fulfilled those criteria. They have taken uh, rigorous measures. That's as what we the European know. Commission has said. The European Commission has concluded that they fulfill the criteria um, and then it's a matter of expectation and it's a matter also of keeping your promise. I think it was a heavy mistake, honestly saying, because taking the arguments, it was a long process. Even we, the European Union, asked Macedonia in these days to change its name to yeah. North Macedonia, to find uh, friendship uh, treaties with its neighboring uh, countries. They changed 
the constitution. They did a lot of reforms mm -hmm. and the, the deal was you have to do this and then you will have the green light for starting uh, negotiations. For Albania, it's not so heavy because they didn't have to change their name, but also they started some reforms. And I think we have to be one thing clear. I understand there is a lot of people who are skeptic if the enlargement will work. And we have to say it's the starting point of negotiation. It's not that exactly. they become member tomorrow. It is that we start to discuss what further reforms they need to do in order to become member. And this should be done, to also answer your question on this, as soon as possible, hopefully in one of the next summits of the European Union. Well, let's give our viewers some context on this and a bit of reaction from uh, the countries that we're talking about. Uh, I've got sound bites for you from Zoran Zaev, who was, at the point when he made this declaration, Prime Minister of uh, North Macedonia. He he resigned just a few days ago, uh, and Eddie Rama, who's the Albanian Prime Minister. Uh, they're talking about uh, setting up uh, cooperation within their region, which is uh, one of the areas where the EU has asked uh, the various candidate countries uh, to make some efforts. Take a listen to what they had to say. The Republic of North Macedonia has no alternative to membership of the European Union. And I believe that this region as a whole has no alternative. But what we are doing today has the aim of exploiting all the potential, all the possibilities that we have to improve quality of life in this region. The idea behind this initiative is not to further divide the Western Balkans, which is already a very splintered region. Rather, the idea is to bring all the other countries in the region on board with this project. So as I said, uh, those leaders were speaking uh, just a, a couple of weeks after they got that uh, no from the European Union leaders uh, and they were setting up what some have called a sort of a mini Schengen uh, with more uh, a sort of a customs union, more movement of people within their countries. Ben Agueta, if I come yes. back to you. OK. Uh, you said that Emmanuel Macron was worried about the process, but he's described uh, Bosnia, for example, as a, a ticking time bomb threatened by Islamist fighters. Uh, he said uh, that other EU members also wanted to reject Albania, but were hiding behind France. It's very mixed messages from France at this point. And all the while, these countries in the Western Balkans are saying, you know, we, we think that we're making the right efforts. We're not sure what the message is. Well, I would say that the two points are perfectly true. I mean, Bosnia and Herzegovina is everything but a stable country, and, and this is an, uh, an understatement. And then Albania, well, it's difficult to say, uh, because I don't want to be uh, rude or unpolite, uh, but the situation of uh, law and order in Albania is uh, not good at all to be yeah. polite, not good at all to be polite. And so why that many countries, so many countries in the European Union didn't want to open the accession process with Albania? Because there were some good reasons, I'm sorry to say so. You so you agree with President Macron that other countries agreed but kept quiet? Absolutely. I think member states can speak for themselves and they all agreed in starting this process. The point is, of course, it's not already completely perfect, but Albania showed a lot of goodwill. They, they undertook a lot of measures, like the whole judges, the judges are, are being assessed on if they are corrupt or not. So they are really making a good efforts. And the point is, if you then start the negotiations talk, you can do a lot more in enforcing the reforms than just saying, keeping your distance and saying, no, you need to do more before we start those process. So why not use this moment and use this process to make sure that these reforms are really becoming sustainable? My answer complete? is very simple, because we already have a political crisis in the European Union, inside. Hey. And if we don't want uh, to uh, make our union to die, I'm sorry, but to die very quickly, we have to take into account the feeling of the citizens. And the feelings of the citizens, unfortunately, but this is a fact, this is a fact, are not so adamant to uh, yeah, but, enlarge again the but European Union. But if we union. are honest, it's not 
that people are afraid of Albania or North Macedonia, no. is that people are fed up with this big divide between rich and poor in our country, that mm -hmm. big companies are not paying taxes, that nobody's giving an answer for the climate thing. This is the big issues which Europe needs to solve. I agree also, with you. Europe must be quicker. No national veto anymore. And what we learned now that even for the enlargement, we had national veto because of uh, the French president, which no, it wasn't I'm a a slightly disappointed because I thought he's a strong European leader. He now is. I mean, he's he certainly he's playing his own game, I would say. No, but to, no you to, to, so. but to come back to the two countries, what we saw is two big leaders, Soran Saif and uh, Edi Rama, which are willing to take big reforms. And you, as a French uh, Macron supporter, you know, people reforms are, are not very often <laughs> supporting every reform. So is a prime minister to get your people say, we have to do the reform. Yeah. Mm -hmm. We have to take it because there is a goal. We all want to be yeah. European citizens. And we are, the Balkan is not is not somewhere distinct from Europe. Absolutely an not. entire part Absolutely of Europe. Not. And Absolutely. there is a young generation waiting since 20 years yeah. who want to have the same possibilities like the other young people but of Europe. But just picking up on Ben Argeta's point, though, about there being crises within Europe, I don't think yeah. that's a secret. Already, this is a yeah. union of soon-to-be 27 member states. That's a lot of countries, and we do see big disparities between yeah, east-west, oh, older, newer countries. But why not starting negotiations and meanwhile saying, OK, you can only become member as soon as we have also solved our internal question, which yeah. is weaker decision-making, no veto, How long would that process be, democracy. realistically? Realistically, I think it doesn't make sense to ask how long it will be if you're even not willing to start it. The, so, the, the green light first. The point is actually, I would hope that Macron and many other leaders would have the courage to really address the problems that we indeed suffer within the EU. If you look at the rule of law problems that we see in Hungary, in Poland, and still there's a political deadlock in the council to really solve and address uh, these problems. And now we are using that argument against other countries who are really willing to undertake reforms. So I think we should not mix up those arguments we should use all the, the instruments that we have to, to solve our own problems and at the same time support the Western Balkan countries. I would also mention, would like to mention another argument and that is the stability. I mean, uh, the Western Balkan countries are in a region very close to our borders, more specifically yeah. by within, EU surrounded by EU member states. So what we have now is a very dissatisfactory situation because there, there may be deficiencies is their problems with rule of law and other rules uh, while we cannot uh, orderly address those problems. So this is creating instability and also risks for our security. So we'd better try to take them on board with uh, very clear demands and criteria, mm -hmm. but start the process so that we can help them better reforming in our direction. But I just want to come back also on the Bosnia argument because mm -hmm. I share that Bosnia is an extremely complicated yeah. state. But the lesson which you have to teach them is you have to solve your problems also by yourself. Mm -hmm. And if you're solving it, you're welcome also for the negotiations of the EU membership. This is what we promised to Macedonia and we did not fulfill. Because yeah. we said, solve your problems with the Greek neighbours and the Bulgarian yeah. neighbours yourself. And if you have solved it, you can come. They solved it and we say, no, now you yeah. should not come. And this is the negative impact. I want to have the positive impact also to mm. tell the, the Bosnians, yeah. solve the problems and then you can also become a member of I, the I think that one of the values of the EU, or maybe one, one brief <laughs> remark, <laughs> is, we that we ben, are, is that we keep our promises, <laughs> right? That we give security, that we say what we do. I remember vividly that Macron addressed the people in North Macedonia prior to the referendum saying, look, please take into account what you are going to vote in the mm -hmm. referendum mm -hmm. uh, and think about what the EU can do for you. And that was an implicit promise. If you change your name, we will be there, you know, to give you this possibility for access. Let's have a response from Bernard Guetta. Well, you know, <laughs> I will tell you, and not because I'm French and a Macron supporter, yeah. this is a fact. Macron is neither naive, stupid, or ignorant of the situation in the Balkans. But he's uh, not ignorant, neither, uh, of uh, the situation inside the European Union. Again, again, let's look at the reaction of our citizens. If we don't want to destroy 
our union, we have first to make some reforms, and not only about the accession process, certainly not. Big reforms, but just, big political but If reforms. I can just make one and, last point, sorry, just about uh, the, the broken promises aspect of things yeah. that Mr. Sheehan mentioned. My question Sheena would mentioned. be, what will be now in the next summit? Yeah. Will be French, the French government mm. be willing to support a green light? It's a question of trust. So. Yeah. The what? The green light? The green light, to start ex uh, accession uh, negotiations for North Macedonia. Will this member of the parliament uh, be willing to support the French proposals on the reform of the, of the accession process? I'm willing and to support so? the reform, not only the French oh, proposal. Okay, <laughs> including, but including, oh, including this one? Yes. Okay, okay. So I, I'm, I'm very much afraid if in May the decision will not be positive, we will see a worsening of the situation in the Western Balkan. The stability will be really at stake and the yes, influence of the European Union of is not a medicine other, for the Balkans. You know, think of Russia, think of Turkey, think of uh, China, Indeed. all the influence that is there <laughs> I know that. in the Western Balkans. I know that, there are other but actors. we are not a medicine. There are other yeah, actors, of course, a... in that region, as you say. Exactly. And, uh, and other countries like Ukraine and Georgia looking for a bit of a Europe European perspective and perhaps asking questions about where that might come. That perhaps is for another day, though. We are out of time. Thank you all so much for taking part in this debate. Thank you to you. Thank uh, there'll you. be Thank a, you. a summit in Zagreb in May of this year uh, with the Western Balkans countries and European leaders. So we'll, of course, cover that on France 24. For now, thanks very much to all Thank of you. my guests for taking Thank part. You. Thanks to you for watching, and we'll see you soon for more editions of Talking Europe on France 24. The country was totally isolated. We couldn't travel. Even the tourists were really controlled. 6,000 people were executed, 35,000 were put in prison, and 50,000 were interned. No private property, no religion, and no human rights. 30 years after the fall of former strongman Enver Hoxha, Tirana, the Albanian capital, is slowly coming out of isolation, but is still licking its wounds. Even now, this moment, it's a bit uh, critical to talk openly about the crimes of communism in Albania. But if we don't go back to our wounds, we are no, never going to take recover of them. France 24 reporters went to meet the Albanians who are still dealing with the ghosts of the past. Enver Hodges Tirana revisited all this week on France 24.